I'm going to begin this morning by talking about a neglected command. I'm going to uh, begin with a story that's a true story. It's, it's told by a pastor uh, that two years before he started ministry, uh, this was in the late 1960s, and he was still in seminary, he began to grapple with Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. I think I put that up there. So get your Bibles out. This is what we'll be looking at this morning, amongst a few other verses, as we discuss the power of the church. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. It says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector." Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst." This pastor goes on to say, I had great difficulty with that passage of Scripture because in my entire life, now granted, this was in the late 60s, he says this, I have never experienced or heard of a church that did that. I only have known and seen it at one time in all my Christian existence of one church that did that, and I happen to be visiting that church today. It was Alistair Begg's church in Solon, Ohio. They brought a woman up that had committed adultery and would not repent, and they, they excommunicated her, okay, with the hope of her being brought back, obviously, to restore it. So he says, he goes on to say, the only part of that scripture in Matthew 18, 15 to 20, I ever heard quoted was a part about two or three being gathered together in my name, and there am I in the midst, and that was almost like a popular axiom. To remind folks that only when a couple of people showed up for prayer meeting, God showed up too. Anyone recognize that? And it consumed me in my thinking, Matthew 18, 15 to 20. I read extensively on that subject, and I could find commentators and theologians who explained the text, but I couldn't find anybody who actually applied it. So I asked some pastors about that passage and if they ever applied it or knew anybody that did, to which I received a universal no. But I said, this is the initial instruction to the church. This is where the word church shows up in Matthew 18 for the first time. This is our Lord's priority concern for the church, that the church be dealing with sin within its own members. How is it that you can read it, understand it, and not implement it? I was told by men much older and much wiser than myself that if I tried to lead a church to do what it says in this passage, I would empty the place. I was told, do you think you can have people in your church walk up to other people in your church and confront their sin without driving them away? And you certainly don't believe that you can announce someone and their sin to the whole congregation, and anybody would show up the next week if you're concerned about church growth. Forget that. But let's see what the Bible says about that, shall we? About holiness and church growth. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Okay, we'll go back to Matthew 18, but Acts chapter 5. I'm just going to read that, verses 1 through 16. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. 
and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? What remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. She said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And the early church protected the purity of the church. If this happened today, and you had the ability to read people's minds, what do you suppose Christians would think? If there was a church that they lied to the leadership of the church and ultimately lied to the Holy Spirit, and they fell dead right here, what do you think would happen? Uh, What do you suppose Christians would think? And you tell that story to your neighbors and the other Christians and so on, what would they think? I think they would logically conclude that visitors would be uncomfortable in this church. Because it's a church where you go to die, right? They'd be afraid, right? Unbelievers especially would not feel safe or comfortable and probably would never attend. This is what we would think. And I would guess that Christians would even properly question how this church would ever grow since they have grown up in churches that try not to offend. I mean, this is what we do, right? We have all these things to make our visitors feel what? Welcome. We call them what? Welcome committees. Guest relations, all of that. Visitor parking, the closest for them. Coffee, we send them letters and stuff like that. They'll come back. This is how we think in today's church growth era. Well, what was God's response to uh, the early church protecting the purity of the church? Verse 11, And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things, At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with with one accord in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with them, however the people held them in high esteem. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any of them. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. Verse 11 tells us a holy fear gripped those in the church who witnessed this act of discipline from the Lord. And those who were part of the church, but probably weren't there to witness it, Fear sees them as well. And also it says fear sees those outside the church. That's the unbelieving world when they heard about this. Verses 12 through 16 tell us that as the gospel was preached and accompanied by many signs and wonders, the church was unified. You see that? In one accord, in Solomon's portico. And what happened? The Lord added to their numbers. In other words, an act of church discipline led to a revival and the church grew. I don't know if you remember, but I told this before, but it fits so well, I figured I'll just tell it again. 
there was a small church for years in Fort Wayne, Indiana called Pine Hills Church that had been around for a long time and just always had about 100 to 200 people. A young pastor came in and through him, um, he would be more like a five talent type of guy. Um, and the church grew. And they grew so rapidly and so fast that they had to get a new building and they did. Um, and as they were growing, and this was maybe a church of 180 people, now I think they're, well, last I knew, and this was like seven years ago, they were a church of 1,800 people. Um, they had a period where they, they, their growth stopped, and then it kind of went down, and then it took off again after about three months. Well, that all coincided with a youth pastor they hired that had an affair. I th- it was at least an emotional affair, maybe a physical affair, but at least an emotional affair with a, a, a student. Um, and the elders tried to confront him and tried to restore him. That's what they wanted to do. Um, and they waited like six months, and it just wasn't really responding. And um, they had one elder that had a high mercy gift. And this is where a constitution is a hindrance. A church constitution is a hindrance to the work of God. Their constitution, and I'll just be frank here, in all stupidity, I'm not a big fan of church constitutions, said that all the elders had to be in agreement before they could move forward to something like this. So four of the five always wanted to, to follow more strictly the word of God. This one didn't, and he held everything up. Finally, the, the pastor and the elders had enough, and they removed that elder, brought in another guy, and they all were in agreement, and they expelled this young pastor. Months later, the church started growing again. One of the objectives of the church is to be so committed to purity and righteousness that people who are not interested in that, they just won't show up. It's a, it's a bit of a paradox. I want people to come to church. I want them to feel welcome. You know, there are guests. I you know, we'll reach out to them. That's great. If they're in sin, I want them to be extremely uncomfortable. Because the simple fact of the matter is, is that all of you have, in all of us, all of you, all of us, have our issues, right? This is a, this is a, a place full of sinful, broken people. This is, in this thinking, uh, the church is so connected to purity that it's a place that those who aren't interested don't show up. This thinking is the opposite of the contemporary approach to hide our commitment to holiness and righteousness so that nobody will at all think we aren't the most loving, accepting, open, embracing people on the planet. Which is why eventually, you know, six years ago this never would have been done, but now it is, you have what we call affirming churches because we want to be open and loving to everybody, even those in their blatant sin. And as we continue our discussion on the church, so far we've covered these topics. The first one was the marks of a true church. Remember that? The three marks, biblical preaching, the observance of the two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, right? And church discipline. But we'll talk about church discipline this morning as we talk about the power of God. The next sermon was on the purity of the church. That was followed by the unity of the church. Now, what I want you to see in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 16, is all those things existed. There's biblical preaching in the early church. Okay? The church was pure. The church was unified. And the church practiced church discipline. Okay? Okay? This morning we'll look at the power of the church. Okay, go back to um, Power Church. Oh, I'll keep this right here. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. Didn't I put that up there? I guess not. Two chapters before Matthew 18. Matthew 16, verses 18 through 19. Let's talk about the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 16, 18, and 19. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my 
church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, 17, 18 is where he, Jesus introduces the first the idea of the church and first mentions the church. Okay? Jesus promises to Peter that he will build his church. We have this so screwed up in today's church. You hire the pastor to do what? But you want them, him to build the church, right? Because you want him to do everything. That's the, the model, that you, um, biblical model. Because everyone wants their church to grow. Amongst pastors, one of the first things we talk about, oh, you pastor this church, you know what they, they say next? How big is it? How big is it? You, you have grown up in the, I mean, there were no, remember this, there were no mega churches until the 50s or 60s. They just didn't exist in all of church history. Okay? Trying to explain to an elder board, I am called to do this, this, and this, whether God built a church or not, is in only in part on me, the pastor. Christ built his church. Now, this is so certain that even Jesus says that the gates of hell will not prevail over it. He will build his church. In verse 19, Jesus says, or references the authority and the power of the church in a word picture using keys. The person who has the keys has a lot of power. If I don't get here in the morning, early, Sally Joe can't get in. Well, why? She doesn't have a key. I have the key. I might be the only one in this church, am I right, that has the key to everything because I'm here all the time? But a few other people, there are keys. I have the key to, I can open every door in this church. I pretty much stay here all week. I'm almost never over here because my office is, but if you have the key, you have a sort of authority and a sort of power. So the guy who has the keys has a lot of power. He can let you in and he can keep you out. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Think about that. You can unlock it and usher people in. You can lock it and keep them out. That is what he is saying. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, you've been given the authority by Jesus Christ on the basis of people's response to the gospel that if they reject it, you can say, sorry, the kingdom is closed to you. You're on the outside. Amen. You're on the outside. Or if, after hearing the gospel, they receive it by faith, you can say, congratulations, the kingdom is open to you. You see, we have the wonderful opportunity of being gatekeepers in the kingdom. And as the Lord is assembling his elect, he employs us as doorkeepers or gatekeepers to usher people in or to tell others they can't come in based upon how they respond to the gospel. And then he says this, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven or has been bound in heaven, loosed in heaven. And that particular statement has been misused repeatedly and for no good reason as a very simple, uncomplicated verse. This is where you need to know your context, but the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis used to say, if you don't repent, your sin is bound to you. If you don't repent, your sin is bound to you. If you do, it's loose from you. If you don't repent, your sin is not forgiven. You're in, you're in sin. If you do repent, your sin is loosed, meaning your sin is forgiven. If we confess our sins, he is what? To do what? Exactly. Okay? He gave us the key and the authority and the power to say that. To put it another way, you obey the law, you're free. You disobey the law, you're bound in sin. So when you say to someone, you won't repent, you're bound in your sin, you're also saying, now watch this, that heaven is in agreement with you. Understand that? 
So when you say to someone, you know, you, you, someone's in, in sin, you say, you're not repenting, therefore you're bound in your sin, you're also saying that in heaven is in agreement with me. That's a powerful statement. You're simply doing on earth what has already been done in heaven. And if you say to someone, because your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, because you confessed your faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are loosed from you, okay, you're also saying that heaven is in agreement with that. So again, you're simply going, you're doing on earth what has been done in heaven. Remember the Lord's Prayer? And that is a, a wonderful privilege. This is why it's never about adding or, or subtracting to the gospel. You don't soften the message or make it too burdensome. Just preach the pure gospel, and you make a judgment based on the, the person's response. Because in this matter, only you, God's children, the church, are the authority in this in the entire world. The world has no authority over this whatsoever. And authority is a delegated authority given to us by none other than Jesus Christ himself. Because what? All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me, and he gives it to us to use. And this is a way to implement that authority. And what we see here is is that that is the work of heaven to get people into the kingdom, and you're a doorkeeper, you're a gatekeeper. But that also means, folks, that you have to share the gospel before you make that judgment. Now, we see this same phrase used in connection with church discipline. Let's go to Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. Let me just say this. Again, Matthew 16, 17, 18, they're all sort of connected And they're all really talking about this issue of sin and restoration. In Matthew 18, verses 12 through 14, you're probably familiar with this story that Jesus has just shared of a shepherd leaving the 99 sheep in search of the one stray sheep. But why? And the key is, you see, it's God's desire that none perish. And he's talking about believers. And if a believer goes into sin and falls away, He doesn't desire that that believer perish. It's God's will that he lose none that he has brought to him, okay? Now, why is it God's desire that none perish? And here's the key. This one of the 99 that has strayed still has great value. How valuable is that person to Jesus? What did it cost him? His life, right? What we celebrated today, communion, his very life. And it's because this person has great value, because it's the heart of God that none perish, what we see here is clearly God is seeking to restore his sinning children in this parable of the 99 sheep and the one that went astray. Now in verses 15 to 20, Jesus tells us that God uses, now watch this, the church as a means to restore the wayward believer. It's God's work, and it's our work. And it's so important to God that he lays out a process. Look at verse 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. So, we seek to restore the wayward brother or sister one-on-one in private to protect their reputation. If he or she refuses to repent... Then you go to verse 16. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. So now you're seeking to restore the fallen brother or sister with one or two witnesses. Why the witnesses? Well, simply a reference to the Old Testament, a verse in Deuteronomy that verified any fact, a verification of any fact called for two or three confirming witnesses. If he or she refuses to repent, then verse 17. 
tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So we seek to restore by telling it to the church. Now the church here, it means the whole church, the gathering or assembling of the congregation. This right here, everybody. Okay, so what you would do is you would tell it to the pastor, you would take it to the elders, and confront the person, and then if not, then the whole church knows. Now that seems a little extreme, doesn't it? My guess is, has anybody ever seen that applied in any church you've ever attended? If it reads, it's, it reads like this scripture that Jesus is saying gang up on him or her. And if it reads that way, because sorry folks, that's exactly what God is saying. Okay? Well, why? Why does he want that? Well, first of all, sin is a serious thing. We just get so comfortable with it, we're surrounded by it, that God takes sin very seriously. Number two, it's so serious because the person has what? Value. He died for that person. And God doesn't want to lose anything valuable. Do you ever want to lose anything valuable? See, it's a different way of seeing. If you see somebody, a brother or sister, they're in sin, what do we tend to do? Let's face it. To be honest, we will judge. We may even despise and look down upon. Okay? And we may, if we have the courage, uh, and usually it takes a type A personality, in my experience, to confront, which that is not an excuse. But you confront in a loving way, what, one-on-one, -on -one, then with another person or two, and then you bring it to the church if there's no repentance at all. Why? Because they're valuable. How valuable are they? Jesus will leave the 99 to go get the one. Number three, it's, you know, why is this? Because I think if you truly care about the person, you simply can't be indifferent to their sin. I mean, let's face it, nobody likes to confront anybody in their sin, but God does it. And you know what? He calls his church to do it as well. So for a brother or sister in sin, the most loving thing you can do is confront them. Because our love for one another is to know no restraint and to have no boundaries. This is why this relentless process of verses 15, 16, 17 of Matthew 18 eventually leads to a public condemnation in the church. And verse 17 even continues the process. It seems harsh. It is meant to be harsh. If they don't listen to church, what happens next? Well, that's all you can do, and what is left is to shun them. Let them be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. Now, why does Jesus even mention these two types of people? Well, if in that society at that time, the most despised and despicable in Jewish society were Jews who had sold their souls to Rome to buy a tax franchise and extort money out of their own people for a pagan, idolatrous nation. In the very book that I'm quoting to you from was written by a tax collector, Matthew. Gentiles were also considered basically dogs, unclean animals to be avoided and despised. If a Jew ever walked into, even accidentally into the home of a Gentile, they were considered unclean and have to clean themselves. Both of these groups were treated as total outcasts and this is the way the church is to treat the unrepentant brother or sister if they won't repent and come back. Now, what does that mean? That means you don't accept them into the fellowship. Well, why? Well, this is it right here. I think I put this verse up here. Actually, I didn't. Don't need to go there yet. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. 
a little sin will permeate the entire body. We are called, folks, to protect what? The purity of the church. Again, the marks of the true church, biblical preaching, the sacraments, and church discipline. The unity of the church and the purity of the church. We're called to protect the purity of the church. And in an effort to protect its holiness, it calls the professing Christian sinner back from sin. Again, seeking to restore a fallen brother is not easy. And so Jesus offers us encouragement in verses 18 to 20. And it should sound familiar because we just went over it. Truly I say to you, whatever you what? Bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again, remember what the rabbis taught. If you don't repent, your sin is bound to you. If you do, it's loosed from you. It simply means that when you bind something on earth, it has already been bound in heaven. And when you lose something on earth, it's already been loosed or forgiven in heaven. So when we confront a sinner and they refuse to repent, we say, you're bound in your sin, and heaven is in agreement with me, and in fact, heaven has already made that judgment. Or when we confront a sinner and they repent, we say, you're forgiven. You're loosed from your sin. And you know what? Heaven is in agreement with me as well. So in other words, we're only saying on earth what has already been said in heaven. We can pray that will be done on earth as is in heaven in those situations. And this is a way, a practical way to implement that. Heaven has already rendered the verdict that someone is bound in sin. They know before we do. They know that someone is already loosed from their sin. We're just reflecting heaven when we do the same. You understand that? Amen. Verse 19, again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. This tells us that when two or three come together and affirm someone's repentance, and heaven is in agreement, we can ask the Lord to cleanse and restore them, and he will. That's the prayer part of this. If they will not repent, we have confidence that, we, that heaven is in agreement with us, and we can ask the Lord to discipline them, and he will. So we're doing heaven's work, and we're doing, you catch this now, we're doing heaven's work, Matthew 16, 18, and 19, and we're doing the Father's work because the Father is a shepherd that what leaves the 99 to go to the one, okay? When we exercise church discipline. We're doing the work of heaven, and we're doing the work of the Father. And then Jesus himself has the final word in verse 20. He says, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Again, this is one of the most out-of-context quoted verses perhaps ever, because people think that Jesus is talking about prayer. This has nothing to do with prayer. This is about church discipline. Think about it. How many do you have to have to have a prayer meeting? One, because you are never alone, right? So it never, we have to have two or three to have a prayer meeting. That's ridiculous. You just need one. It doesn't take two or three. So this doesn't have anything to do with a prayer meeting. It has to do with a discipline situation. When the verse says where two or three have gathered together, it means that the process of restoration is already in motion. You've already gone one-on-one. -on -one, they didn't repent. Now you're doing what? Two or three on one, and that's what that refers to. The discipline process is, the restoration process is already in motion. And now we have the confidence that there I am in their midst. So if I, for example, let's just say that Brian is in sin and I go to him, he doesn't repent. Then I go to him with, with Don and Ron. Okay, now there's three of us and one of him. But the reality is there are four of us in one of him. Because who's there with us? Jesus. See, Jesus is with us. Now, you ready to have your mind blown away? Think about this and let it sink in. Never is the church more in tune with heaven and in tune with the Father and in tune with Christ himself than we were dealing with sin.
Never is a church more in tune with heaven, because it's the work of heaven, and in tune with the work of the Father. He's the shepherd that leaves in 99, and now we know we have Christ with us. We're never more in tune with Christ himself than we are dealing with sin. This is why we don't want to be reluctant in any of this. And trust me, this is what pastors have to learn this lesson in a usually very, very painful way, is you just avoid conflict. You avoid sin in the church. And it always comes back to bite you. It's like having cancer and just, I'm not going to deal with it. It has to be dealt with. And it becomes a bigger problem in the end if you just dealt with it strongly, biblically, in the very beginning. Unfortunately, this is what the church does, though. But we do all this, this confronting, we follow this process of church discipline for the purity of the church. It's heaven's work, it's the Father's work, it's the Son's work, it is to be the work of the church as well. well what happens to the church that does not implement the power given to it and does not apply the authority given to it and tolerate sin? Well, this is where you go to here. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. First two verses. It is actually, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You've become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. The first thing that obviously happens, and it's not even mentioned here, but it, it was something that eventually uh, impacted this church. Uh, the testimony of Christ suffers. Number two, you see it right here in the text, that if you tolerate sin, it opens the door to other sins. There was incest in the church. Now, look what else, verse two. They became arrogant. Hearts were hardened. They didn't mourn over this. And number three, you wouldn't know this, but I'll share this with you. The church becomes a repeat offender. History tells us that the New Testament doesn't give us any further information about the church at Corinth. However, Clement of Rome wrote a letter to them probably near the end of the first century, almost 50 years after Paul's time ministering there. And guess what? He had to deal with the same issues again. The most loving thing you can do to a fallen brother or sister is confront them in their sin. Why? Look at verse 3. For I am my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled... And I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The hope is to restore the sinning brother so that their soul may be saved. Notice it says, though, in the day of the Lord Jesus. Do you remember anything we talked about what it will be like on the day of the Lord? the day of the Lord Jesus. Remember this? It describes the time of darkness in the sky where the great light of the glory of God pierces through the darkness and Jesus comes again with his army. And on earth there is what? Great terror. People are dying of heart attacks. Fear is overwhelming. They're trembling as people hide themselves under rocks and in caves to get away from the presence of God and the impending judgment that they know is about to happen. There's a massive bloodshed at the Battle of Armageddon and the judgment of God, the separation of the sheep and the goats and the great wine throat judgment. Whenever those happen, the, 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 the casting of bodies and souls into hell and the lake of fire, that's the day of the Lord. It's a terrible and awesome day. Now we have a glimpse of what it is like to suffer in hell. And everyone turn there because it's not pretty in Luke 16, 19 through 24. It says, there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gates, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. And the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. 
And he cried out and said, and here's the key point, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. That is what awaits those who do not know Jesus Christ. That is what awaits those that sin in the church. And if they don't repent, they give evidence that they never were really of the church. Now, we don't know that. I don't know your heart. I can guess. But let us not forget the words of J.C. Rowell. He wrote this, There is no repentance in the grave. There is no conversion after the last breath is drawn. Now is the time to believe in Christ and to lay hold of eternal life. Now is the time to turn from darkness to light and to make our calling and election sure. If we leave this world refusing to repent, and that's the point, we need the, the, the wayward brother to repent. And it's our job to call him when they're in sin to repent. If we leave this world refusing to repent and believe we will rise in the same condition on resurrection morning and find it would have been better for us if we had never been born. Let me close with the story I began with this morning of this new pastor starting his ministry in his first church. After moving his family, he wrote this. He said, we wanted more people to come so more people could hear the word of God and be saved. And we could extend the kingdom and advance the gospel. But even then, I understood that the Lord builds his church, Matthew 18, 15 to 20. So the first time I... Uh, Actually, Mark, Matthew 16, 18, and 19, and Matthew 18, 15, and 20. The first time I met with a group of elders, okay, this is a, a new pastor, fresh out of seminary, they posed a question to me about doing a wedding in the church. It was a wedding of a daughter of a very, very prominent family serving in many capacities in the church. Their daughter was getting married, I recall, to an older divorced man, not a believer. And I said, I can't do that. I can't marry a believer to a non-believer. To which someone replied, well, that's going to offend them. I said, well, I feel badly about that, but there's somebody else I'm more concerned about offending, and that's the Lord of this church. And I can't do that. To which one of the men responded by saying, well, okay, I understand that. That's a conviction you have. So, but, so that we'll, what we'll do is you don't have to do the wedding, but we'll have it here. This will make them feel better. And I remember saying, then this is the first meeting, by the way, with his elders. I said, is this your church? It's not my church. Is this your church? Whose church is it? To which the same person replied, it's the Lord's church. And I said, well, maybe we ought to do what the Lord wants done in his church. I can't do it, and it can't be done here at all because it's wrong to mix a believer with an unbeliever clearly in Scripture. And he goes on to write that that was a watershed moment. Not long after, the church in which he, this young pastor ministered it grew very fast. First two years it doubled, the next two years it doubled again. And he says, and in those early years, at some point, reporters said to me, do you have a, a great desire to build the church? I said, actually, I have no desire to build the church because Jesus said he would build the church and I don't want to compete with him. This is not my church. This is his church. I just want to know how he builds his church and do that which he's called me to do as an instrument by which he can do his work. It was very clear to me at that time that this issue of holiness in the church in dealing with sin was monumental. So, I know you're glad I'm done, and I'm done. So, I, I forgot all these. I'm sorry. Here we go. What do you do with something like this? Well, that's the power that, that we have been given. We're gatekeepers. We let people in and out of the kingdom as we share the gospel. And we protect the purity of the church. And when we confront a believer who is in sin, who's on our side? Heaven? the Father, and the Son. And let me tell you that it is a common problem in churches, and I've been involved in denominations and everything. 
Nobody likes conflict. Most people avoid it. And that is probably a reason why uh, the state of the church is what it is. So, I'm asking you this week, we sing holy forever, just examine yourself. Okay? Examine yourself and confess your sin. Strive to be a, who you're called to be, a holy kingdom. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you. We thank you that, yeah, you're holy forever, but you know, right now we are too, because you chose us in eternity past, that we'd be holy and righteous before you. May we live out that holiness, and may we exercise the power that you've given us. Thank you for the keys you've blessed us with. Thank you for the power and authority you've given us. May we use it humbly and wisely. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a great Sunday. God bless you.